It's a great pleasure to uh, to be invited by Sean to talk in the uh, the Melbourne Logic Seminar, and um, and we're going to oh, okay. So thanks, Sean, for the invite. It's it's a great pleasure, and thanks, Shay, for all the work in the Logic Supergroup. Because if there is one silver lining on all these disasters that we are having at the moment is the fact that we have many more talks and, and we can talk to people that we haven't seen in a while. And it's been, uh, from the perspective of talking to people, it's been a great, uh, it's been great fun. So I tried to find a picture of Shay, uh, where, where, uh, I tried to find a picture of Sean where I met him, which was the NASLI 2016. Um, but I couldn't. Uh, I thought he and Re Greg doing a double a double bill on the same board, each one writing a different part part of the board was really great. But I lost the picture, so and just have him by himself here. And I, I think I also want to thanks Harley for the collaboration in this in this project. And um, and we'll hear more about him and and parts of. of what we've been doing together, but um, as you can, as you will be able to see in a moment, this is very much about the Lambeck calculus, not for computational linguistics, but for um, programming languages and 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 as um, logical system, a basic logical system itself. And I guess before kind of going to the real introduction, I should say that. Uh, you're li listening today about the Lambic calculus because Greg was interested in, in hearing about the Lambic calculus. So that's that's why we are talking about that today. So what I want to talk about is about modeling the Lambic the Lambic calculus using dialectical categories, and one has to be careful when talking about Lambic calculus because it looks so much like lambda calculus that. You know, people tend to confuse when you're, they're just listening. But when written, it's perfectly fine. And this work is dedicated to Jim Lambeck, who passed away in 2014. Actually, on the 23rd of June, 2014, so um, just six years ago. And, and, and Jim was a very interesting and and, and, uh, and kind of nice person to talk to. I, I talked to him several times uh, and because he had a very uh, diverse career, you know, people knew about him in, in, in different um, in different communities and uh, I think it was very f funny for me to, to, to kind of meet the first computational linguist that I met kind of in 19... 89 or 1990, that kind of billions of years ago. And they said to me, oh, so you do category theory, so you know about Jim Lambeck? And I said, yeah, I do. And they said, uh, you know, how was he? And I said, well, I, last time I talked to him, he was fine. And they looked at me, isn't he bad? You know, <laughs> isn't he? <laughs> they, he had worked in, in the Lambeck calculus in 1958. We're talking about 1988, so 30 years later. So some of the guys assumed that, and he never, uh, until 88, he was not doing anything in computation, in linguistics for a while. So people assumed that he uh, had passed away then. But that's kind of a long while before i mean he he lived to have lots of books about his 75th birthday the, the, his 90th birthday so he he did kind of a, a good job um and so you know this anecdote was to show that um that the lambic calculus um can be seen from very different uh, directions uh, I, I put some numbers down there. Kind of 1958 was when the Lambic calculus was in, uh, was uh, appeared, and then Jim had another paper in 1961 on the non-associative Lambic calculus. Then he had this uh, uh, very 
I met him in, in a meeting in Boulder, Colorado in 1987, I think, and where, uh, which um, then became the paper in 1988 about um, categorical and categorical drama, which is, um, I think, was the one that appeared in the AMS volume 92. But it might have been the multi-categories one, which is a very exciting paper too. And, and then kind of from 93 to 2000, and that's Claudia, Claudia Casagio who kind of uh, apparently convinced Jim that, that he should go, go back to the to linguistics and, and Mernos Zadras who kind of also worked with him on his different um, approach to linguistics that, that it's not the lambic calculus, but the pre-groups and, and, and stuff like that. Um, but, but I don't want to kind of go on that direction. I, I want to talk to you about categorical proof theory, and I want to talk to you about dialectical categories. And these things kind of take a quite a long time to explain. So bear with me and let's see how, how we're doing. So, as I was saying, I kind of met this computational linguists in the late ages and stuff. And one of the things that they told me then was that, uh, so that's this paper called Categorical Deductions and Structural Operations. Because you see, um, along this, uh, around this time, kind of linear logic was appearing on the scene. So people kind of got excited about thinking about structural rules and, and, and stuff like the Lambic calculus again. So these guys, um, these four guys, Glenn Morrow, Neil Leslie, Mark Heppel, and uh, Guy Berry were doing PhDs in, in Edinburgh. And they come up with this first paper called Categorical Deduction and Structural Operations. And they had to say that the use of the Lambic calculus for linguistic work has generally been rather limited. And they thought there were two main reasons for that. One was the denotations uh, that Lambic was using, so sequent calculus, traditional sequent calculus, was not a very good notation for proofs. Because as everyone knows, sequent calculus kind of has too many proofs that mean the same. And, and, and hence, they wanted to move from sequent calculus to natural deduction. And the other problem that they saw was that the calculus, as, as it stood in 1988, uh, was not powerful enough to describe many phenomena that they could see in natural language. And they were very excited about the idea, the general idea, of adding modalities to extend the expressive power of the calculus. So they didn't want to kind of put modalities to go back to logic as we know it, but they wanted modalities that would deal with specific linguistic phenomena, like discontinuation, not, discon not uh, discontinuous gaps and stuff like that. You can check on the paper. And Eita. Um, sorry, I missed one. Ah, yeah, that's the second one. And, you know, they, they come up, they and, and lots of other people, particularly in the Netherlands, came up with this idea that, um, that grammar should be regarded as analogous to logic and derivations should be, derivations in the grammar should be analogous to proofs. So what they were advocating at that stage was proof reduction and normal form proofs. And they called the whole thing uh, passing as deduction, which is a, a slogan that seems to have disappeared a bit, but, but I still think it's a, it's a very interesting idea. And they went on to do, to, to get excited about all the other sides of linear logic, in particular proof nets, and there's an awful lot of, of work that came out of thinking, instead of natural deductions, thinking of um, proof nets for categorical grammars. Uh, Sean, if there's too much noise from my kitchen, let me know, okay? And I'll put, um, I'll, I'll try to, to have a, a some hit headphones, but hopefully we'll be okay. So what, 
what I'm using these two introduction slides to say is that um, I never kind of thought so much about the, um, the lambic calculus as a way of doing linguistics or computational linguistics. I am actually very excited about the lambic calculus as a way of doing easy logic or, or logic of a very specific kind. So if you look, uh, and so, you know, this is the number one, we're doing lumbar calculus. We're going to try to talk about dialectical categories and we're going to put them together. But I think I'm, mis I'm confusing myself. But, you know, if you think about uh, what is the lumbar calculus and if you never heard of it, and you want to think of it as a purely logical system, the thing that you do is you think about propositional classical logic, you think about Jensen's propositional calculus, and you just get rid of all the structural rules, including, um, including exchange. And if you do that, you end up with two kinds of implications, a left implication and a right implication. And, and that's how we are going to be thinking of the Lambic calculus. And I think, I think that's how he actually thought of it. Um, I cannot guarantee it, of course, but I, I think that's how he uh, would would think of it. Uh, but but you know, it it actually um, comes from a long tradition from the thirties, from Majukovic and Bahilo uh, of of type grammars. And as I was saying before, there is kind of a huge collection of, of, I mean, there's several different schools of thought along these lines. The, I mean, I have put in here only the old ones. I did not put the, the more modern ones like uh, Philippe de Groot's um, abstract category grammar or, or, or Christian Cretore's uh, new stuff. And I haven't put anything about um, pre groups and, and and the more modern stuff that kind of connects to quantum phenomena. So this 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 thing is exploding right now because of the connections between um, this stuff, uh, this categorical grammars and um, and the quantum stuff. So lots of of different work, but but we're going to be very pedestrian and we're going to think. Uh, as I was saying, we're going to think about classical logic without any structural rules, and we see how we can deal with that. Even on this side of, of totally pedestrian, I mean, more pedestrian stuff, we the Lambert calculus has been very well, uh, it is very well represented in, in lots of algebraic logics. Um, lots of people have done work recently on um, duality and abstract theories of duality. And in particular, I mean, I'm, I'm sorry, I couldn't get a picture of theory, but uh, in particular, there is this program of algebraic proof theory uh, started by Agatha Ciabattoni and Nick, Nick Galatus and uh, Kazuichi Terui, but I, I couldn't find a picture of him. And what they, what they take the, the Lambert calculus as is, is the basis of a substructural hierarchy. And, um, and they work on top of, 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 of this hierarchy. But they, they also kind of introduce new, um, new ideas into that. So the, the, the work that, that, that I'm describing, um, which was started uh, in the 80s uh, as, a, as a pure work in category theory, um, do not have some of the stuff that these guys are doing, which is this notion of polarization of the logic. So the, the work that I'm talking about, which, which you can read, because it is, um, I mean, it's published as an ENTCS somewhere, uh, I will give you the, the, the proper link in a minute. But um, this work was first presented in a totally purely mathematical conference in Durham. 
in a totally uh, linguistic kind of conference in, in Amsterdam. And, uh, and then in a more programming lang language uh, conference in uh, much more recently. So, you know, it is one of these things that actually kind of plays in the three different sides uh, that, that we want to play. So what is the Lambert calculus? I said it's just Gensen system um, without any structural rules. And you, you have to take on faith this, uh, this extra step that I mentioned that, you know, you, 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 you have, um, ah, someone could find <laughs> Terry's picture. Thank you. I, I, as I said, I, Google could not find it. I put, I did, perhaps I didn't put his full name. Perhaps I just put K Terry's and Google could not find a single picture of him. But, um, the, the system here kind of has tensors like in, in traditional linear logic has um, has the the constant for the tensor, which is something that um, in Lambeck calculus is, is debatable and lots of people don't want to have this I sitting there, but we're doing category theory, so we, we're doing algebra, so we have it. We have cut and and we eliminate it, that's as usual, and you have to take on faith just this step that I mentioned, that since we want a tensor product that behaves like, um, behaves like concatenation of, of, of sequences, um, we, so we don't want the tensor product to be commutative. We want it to be non-commutative and hence there will, and, and, and then you can think about the, the implication into this tensor product as um, a left implication or a right implication. And these are the rules that you have there for um, arrow left and arrow right. But they are totally uh, traditional. So, and as I was saying, I kind of had a quick picture of Gödel passing by just to uh, remind you of what he looked like and to kind of give you a a hint of why um, why we're dealing with uh, this model that's uh, this very, I mean, this kind of complicated model that you're going to see in a minute. So, you know, that's, that's this slide is kind of why dialectica. So for Gildo in 1958, that was, you know, I don't think, the Lambert calculus was being uh, written at the same time, but I don't think the guys had any conversations. So the Gödel was tr trying to prove consistence of higher order arithmetic. Uh, in 87, uh, when Girard saw the work that I was doing, the dialectic, I think he was very excited about it because it was a way of showing that linear logic had a pedigree, had kind of coming from something that Gilder had done about consistence of arithmetic. For Martin, in 1987, the way he presented the problem to me was a, an intrinsic way of modeling Gilder's dialectica. So it was his main, uh, one of the things that he actually, since 2000, since 1987, has been doing, which is his idea that one should do proof theory in the abstract, kind of one should look at the insights that category theory gives you and um and in this case if uh if you're thinking like Gödel that that um that the way to prove consistence of higher order arithmetic is to think about uh structures mathematical structures that um allow you to transform any formula of higher order arithmetic into formulas of a specific shape and the specific shape is a uh, exists u for all x a of u x um, that this sort of transformation of formulas into um, specific shape formulas has to you know he himself had proved the incompleteness uh, Theorem. So you know, if you if if you want to prove the consistency, then 
what you need to do is some, I mean, it's, it's like a, a too short blanket, right? So, you know, you have to move the difficulty somewhere else and he moved them to the system T of functionals. So his thought was that, um, at least for mathematicians, um, natural numbers and functions on the natural numbers had some sort of uh, intrinsic appeal and, and something that you felt was much more comfortable than analysis. So you thought of it as being maps that you could, if need be, investigate and look at. So he, he made the system T something where you only had primitive recursion, but your types can go very high, very quickly. So you're trading off um, a very um, a, a system where you can control things for something where you have the you you have the types taking over. So you have structure. You, you hope that the structure of the, those types will kind of do lots for you. And hence, it should produce a Cartesian closed category because you know it's almost like an intuitionistic logic. Not, not quite. You have to add some extra principles. In, in my case, you have to ask for independence of premise, which is not um, an intuitionistic principle, and you have to ask for Markov's principle, which again, uh, lots of constructivists don't accept, but others do, especially the Russians. And if you accept these things, then um, then Gödel's dialectic does show you uh, that um, that you have a, a consistent proof of, of of arithmetic that is as intuitionistic as possible, but actually gives you the whole of of classical arithmetic by use of two translations: the dialectic and the double negation translation. Well, for me, for me, the, the, the whole idea of dialectical categories was just a Swiss army knife, meaning something that you can apply to different problems. And uh, I started applying it to linear logic. So, so I started applying it to Gödel's dialectica. Uh, I discovered that it actually ended up being a model of intuitionistic linear logic. Uh, I had a big suggestion from Girard how to make it a, a model of classical linear logic. And, and then from then on, I kind of started kind of playing with the system and, and producing different models of different things. And that's what I mean by Swiss army knife. So how does this whole thing, and, and okay, I kind of, once again, uh, the Swiss army knife here is going to deal with a system that is non-commutative. So uh, all the systems that, that I was describing before are commutative. And at that stage, Rad himself was saying that, uh, that commutativity in the logic is an important assumption because it helps us a lot, particularly with proofs of cut elimination. But even for things that are non-commutative, if you kind of care for enough, the dialectic will help. And that's what we want to see. So this is, this is a picture to remind you that um, we're always dealing with these three sides of problems. We, we're dealing with proof theory, uh, kind of traditional proof theory in the style of Dyke Kravitz. We're talking about functional programming. Well, people kind of, we're talking about type theory in the style of lambda calculus. And we're talking about category theory. And what we want to do is we want to keep this triangle working in all the systems that we deal with. So types are formally in logic uh, and are objects in the appropriate category. Terms, are, terms or programs are proofs or morphisms in the category. The logical constructors are appropriate categorical constructions and appropriate is the difficult word here. So that's, that's where we have to work hard to find what is the appropriate structure. And most important, and lots of people don't pay attention to it, but most important is this idea that reduction is actually proof normalization in natural deduction. And, um, and that reduction is preserved by this three 
sides of the of the triangle and that's an idea of Tate so some people could even call it a Curry Howard Tate isomorphism but having this kind of clever triangle we can transfer results from logic to categories and computing and vice versa we can use things that we know work in category theory to suggest things both in logic and in type theory so the totally um, trivial um, way to look at this is just to look at traditional intuitionistic implication and on top you see the natural deduction rules for implication without terms and on the bottom you see how you should add variables of types so kind of uh, a is a is a has a proof x so x in a means that x is a proof of a and then if i use this um this proof of a into pi to produce a term m of type b then i can abstract the x and have a proof of a implies b and i can apply the main uh, use of of implications to kind of uh, apply it to uh, to produce from a to a to b and a to get to rb so in principle that's all you need to know because we're not dealing with the lambda calculus which is just that but non-commutative so you have two versions of that and and you know if if you're going to forget everything about this talk and say ah oh, that was horrible then at least you have like nice pictures to look at so this is the original curry howard correspondence so in around 1965 so Pravitz proved um, proved what Kensen wanted to prove which was that the natural deduction the way that he thinks mathematicians think about proofs uh, does not have any the tools does not have any uh, all that the tools can be eliminated that corresponds in a very precise way that we are not going to discuss here to Cartesian closed categories and, and adjunctions as in Lovia's uh, first papers. And that corresponds to the lambda calculus of, of, of Church. And the interesting thing that lots of people don't realize is that this same sort of triangle can be pushed in for other logical systems and other systems of, of categorical logic and other systems of, of terms. So in particular, we can do the same thing for linear logic and we can and, and we end up in some notion of linear categories and we end up in a some version of linear lambda calculus which is kind of again um, not as clear cut i mean you have to work hard to make sure that everything works the way you want it to work but the version for the lambda calculus uh it's much easier than the one for linear logic because it actually existed um, much before linear logic, right? Uh, the monoidal by closed categories were uh, described by Max Kelly and, and others, but kind of many years before. And, and, and Jim Lambeck had kind of come up with the proof calculus for the so called now, nowadays called Lambeck calculus. And uh, even Church already he still had. Um, a version of the linear lambda calculus, which I think he was call, calling the uh, lambda i, because he wanted variables to always be present uh, on the on this stuff. So, I mean, it's not exactly that, right? Because uh, we he was not paying so much attention to the fact that uh, that 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 you needed two different implications. But this triangle existed before linear logic came into the in the scene now we're kind of trying to get into the category theory itself right and we're kind of looking at what is the problem with modeling linear logic if you are a young logician who kind of you know it's not afraid of algebra it's not afraid of, of proof theory and you just kind of want to say oh, okay that's me let me see how how i can do this so the traditional categorical modeling of intuitionistic logic, this one that exists since the 60s, uh, works very well. And you, you, you know that you think about conjunctions A and B as products of types. So, you know, 
for a lot of us, these two things are exactly the same. You sometimes say conjunction when you actually meant a product or types and vice versa. You say product when you actually meant a conjunction and it's all the same. And the set of functions from A to B is the same thing as the internal home, which we normally write in, uh, in mathematics, like B to the A for the set of functions from A to B. But these things are real products. So they have real projections and real diagonals. And projections um, means that you can throw away a formula when you are looking at its, uh, when you're looking at the, the proof theory behind it. And the diagonals are exactly the ability to duplicate a formula. So deletion and duplication of resources are exactly what we don't want to have because they are not linear, right? The, you know, if you have a little a in A and you try and you make it twice of the same A, then you, you're losing this idea of linearity that everything exists exactly once and can be used exactly once. So to model these things, category theory had already produced what you needed. So, you know, you need to use tensor products and internal homes and, and category theory knew all about it. What is hard, what was hard, was to define the make everything as usual, the operator bang or shriek or, or of course, as Girard called it. And this, on the other hand, as I was saying at the beginning, that's one of the reasons why the guys doing linguistics were so excited about it, because they could see that operators like the bang, like the pling, would be useful for lots of other things. So um, here in this, um, I mean, the, the, the stuff that I did for my thesis is kind of it's a short thesis, it has four chapters and four big theorems. And that's the simplest of the, uh, of the four theorems. Um, so it's, these two are the simplest ones. And it's a mathematical construction, right? And I kind of kept saying to people, oh, you've got to like category theory to, to come to this talk and, and have some, get something out of it. So this is the simplest cat dialectical category and, and it's not too bad, you know. The objects of this category are triples. And these triples have two objects, U and X, and they have a, a relation, R. So R is a set theoretical relation, so you could think of it as being a sub, subset of U cross X. And, and again, I'm kind of, in the thesis I was doing over a category C, but here I'm just doing sets because that's the only thing you need to see to understand it. So, U and X are sets, and R is a set theoretical relation. So you can think of it as either as, you know, the subset of the U's and X's that are in R, so a, a subset containment there, or as a map from U cross X into two. And then you just read that, you, you know, either little U relates by R to little X, and that's one, or little U does not relate to little X by R, and that's zero. So the, the two there is the, uh, is the co-product of one plus one. So the objects are not too bad. They're just these triples and everyone can play with them a lot. But, but amorphism is where things kind of start getting out of the traditional in category theory. Because amorphism between a triple UXR and a triple VYS is a pair of functions and little f goes from u to v. And that's where things kind of get different. And a capital F, which instead of going down the same ways as the, as the little f, it goes backwards. So that's already a little bit different, but, but you know, people do think a lot, a, a lot about these things in category theory, so it's not so different still. What really makes the dialectical work is this semi-adjunction condition that, uh, that this maps, this pair of maps, little f and capital F have to satisfy. And this semi-adjunction condition says that whenever uh, the first relation alpha relates little u and, the, uh, and f of y, so 
the capital, the, the capital function, the one that comes backwards, uh, applied to i. Whenever you have that, this implies that the little f will be the relate to, to the y. Why do I say that is a, a semi-adjunction condition? Well, because, you know, of course, little f and big F are not functors. They are just elements of your uh, maps on your category C. But, um, and again, if for, for to be a, a real junction, you'd have to have an if and only if there instead of a simply implies. But so it's a kind of a, a lax adjunction, is that an adjunction that goes only in one direction. And this direction is a little bit like what you want the logic to tell you, because you want the logic to say that uh, if something happens, then something else happens. You, you want, um, if you're thinking about that in, in dialect, like, dialectical like terms, you're thinking about the fact that these triples have on the left hand side things that are trying to prove theorems. And on the right hand side, it has things that are counterexamples. They are trying to, to prevent the proof of the theorem, they are trying to refute a theorem. And if, um, and if the relation on the top is satisfied, implies the relation on, on, on the bottom, then what we're doing is that we are doing entailments that can be composed. And, and, and that's the bare minimum that we need. And so what I did kind of a long, long time ago was to prove that this category that we are seeing described there uh, has a symmetric monoidal closed structure. So it, it, it is a model of linear logic instead of being a Cartesian closed category, which would be a model of intuitionistic logic. And you can provide it with an involution that makes it a, a model of um, this whole of multiplicative linear logic. I started by just doing the intuitionistic version, but to do the classical version, you, you, you kind of, um, you need to add this, um, this involution. And as I say, the, the first theorem is not so hard. Uh, the hard part is to show that you can provide it with a common ad blink that models the modalities in linear logic, and hence you can recover intuitionistic and classical logic. And that is the important thing about linear logic, because, you know, Lots of people in Australia already have been doing kind of relevant logic. They're doing things and thinking about things like linear logic, but to my mind, they did not have this idea that you actually don't want to force people to move from one logic to the different one. You actually want to have both of them, and it's kind of traditional idea of having your cake and eating it, because if you have linear logic with this, um, with this co-monad as, as it turns out, then you can pay attention to, you can pay attention to, to the resources whenever you feel like it, but you can forget it if you prefer to kind of stay with either intuitionistic logic or even classical logic if that is what you want to do. So you might kind of now want to stop me and say, uh, can you give me some intuition for these categories? And then as, as I was saying, Glass makes a very good case for thinking of these things as problems in computational complexity. So you can think intuitively of an object of, of this category as representing a problem. And the elements of the U are instance of the problem and the elements of X are possible instantiations of the problem. So the answers to the problem instances and the relation R says whether the answer is an answer to that problem or not it's, it's kind of sense in, in a sense if it's correct for that instance of the problem and as i was trying to say before uh, the the fact that these morphisms have two components kind of means or tries i mean is trying to give an, an intuition that uh, the the little f maps instance of the problem to instance of another problem and capital f map solutions backwards. And you can see some examples here. Um, these examples are from recent work with Samuel Gomes da Silva, who kind of um, 
who showed me that this same construction could be used in set theory for, for I mean, he, he kind of showed me not only, I mean, when I first saw Blast's paper saying these things, I said, well, yeah, but I'm not so interested in set theory. But actually, it turns out that I am interested in, 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 in the kind of set theory that, that Samuel and I have been doing, which is kind of thinking about cardinalities and stuff like that. And, and so, you know, you, you, you could have an object, a totally trivial object like natural numbers, natural numbers and equality, and you say that, you know, an alpha uh, relation there is simply to say that N is only related to M if they are the same. Uh, but you can have extremely complicated things like the object which has n to the n and uh, applies to and applies to n, and, and that's just another alpha relation as far as we are concerned with this with this big category that we have. So the simplest is not very simple in, in reality, and and you know I kind of gave another talk in another supergroup meeting kind of for two hours just uh, describing this kind of simple example. And I'm not going to do that to you guys. It's not necessary, but I thought I was going to at least show you how, what are the steps that you have to prove to show this theorem, right? And of course you have to show that dio two sets is a category. That's very easy. Uh, you have to show that dio two sets has an internal home. That's not so easy. Um, you then have to show that there is a tensor product in the category. Then you have to show the very nice thing that there is an adjunction. So all the maps from A tensor B to C, where you know A, B, and C now are the triples, right? Each one of them is a different triple. Uh, that these maps are the same as maps from A to the internal home from B to C. And then you have to describe inv the involution and, and the path constructor of linear logic. If, if you want to prove this theorem. So just to kind of give an, uh, I mean, the calculations are done in the paper. If someone can go and, and, and look at it carefully, but just to tell you a little bit about the difficulty that, that, that this causes is that, you know, what we're trying to do is we're trying to internalize in the notion of morphism or, or map between two of those problems or two of these triples. So, and if you remember the, the semi-adjunction condition, it's a little bit complicated. So what we need to do is you need to consider all the maps from U to V. So that is the V to the U there. You have to consider all the maps from Y to X, and that's the X to the Y there. And you need to make sure that, the pair, that any pair that is in the internal home, any pair little f, capital F, satisfies this dialectical condition that for all u and u and for all y and y if u alphas f of y then f of u beats y so uh there shouldn't be a dc there that should be a dialectical two sets but you know th this will give us an object in the category so a third um a third triple which has this very complicated and wrong uh object, I do apologize, I thought I had co corrected. Uh, this is the, uh, the, the more complicated uh, thing on the thesis. Here, there should be just V to the U, X to the Y, U cross Y. And the difficult, which is kind of, I mean, once you had this idea that you just pick up the collections of the maps that you want and force them to have the relation that you want, it's much easier because then the calcul the type checking almost does it does itself. So the thing that you need to do is kind of find a relation between these two guys going to two and using the things that you want. So you know what have we got? We have sets and we have uh, sets of functions. And what can we do with sets of functions? Well. The only thing we can do is apply them, right? So, you know, I have a, a V to the U. What do I do? I give it a little U and apply it and get something in V. I have an X to the Y function. I kind of apply it to a, a little Y and, and see if the result kind of satisfies the, 
the relations that we are given to begin with, the alpha and the beta. And it does, so everything works. Now, just to not have a completely uh, devoid of theorems uh, talk, I thought I was going to show you, how, and that, I mean, this talk, when I was giving to the philosophers, it was only a 20 minute talk, so I did not do that, but I thought here, I might kind of just as I'll well show you the fun of doing category theory. So we want to show that A tends to be going to C, if and only if A goes to the internal home of B to C. And I actually just showed you how to do internal homes in the previous slide, except that I did for A to B, and now I'm using it from B to C. So, you know, remind yourselves that we have three objects. The first one, the A is U and X, the B is V and Y, and the C is W and Z. So, um, and we want to prove that now we have a real if and only if it's a, a real adjunction, right? You know, this adjunction is the most important thing, thing in, in logic, right? It's the deduction theorem purely. Right, so if A and B implies a C, then I can just send the B to the other side and, and say that A implies that B implies C. And as I was saying, it's just type checking because you have now, if you look at the left hand side, you have, uh, and I, okay, I'm cheating a little bit because I gave you the, the internal home down there, but I did not show you what the tensor looked like but it's on the top here and it's a cross product uh, you know some people might not like the cross product um, lots of people complain about the cross product actually but um, but it is a, a reasonable thing in mathematics lots of people kind of make whole lives out, out of thinking of cross products and um, and again if, if you actually want to see the deduction term in, in action, you have to use your tensor product here. And, you know, the proof here is just looks at, you, you just have to do two bits. You have to look at the, at the maps and see that the maps that I have on the left are exactly the ones that I have on the right, up to occurring in, in sets, right? Up to kind of taking, making the same sort of, uh, you know, to my students of calculus billions of years ago, I would just say that, you know, you kind of, you can stop one parameter and send the function to the other side and, 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 and that's it. So you have a little f that goes from u cross v to w. You need to find it on the other side. And on the other side, you have a u that goes from, to, a u that goes both to w to the v and to y to the z. So, you know, the first one, u cross v to w, goes u cross v to w is the first one here. And the g2 goes from z to y to the u. So, uh, check. That should be the, uh, the, sorry, the first one, z to x to the v, that will give us v cross z to x, which is, the, the second side here and the last one uh, is the z to y to the u so that is u cross z u cross oh uh, it's u cross z to y and then you do another curring to move the to get the u separate so you get the y u to y to the z and the miracle of the dialectical is that these simple manipulations that you do with the morphisms, which are just kind of the obvious stupid thing, actually they carry the, the relations with them. So that was the simplest dialectical that I could do. And, you, and I'm supposed to be talking about the lambic calculus. So what is different here? Well, now we have to have a non-commutative tensor, and we need to have the true left and right implications, and we want to disturb many, minimally the, oops, 
and I should stop here, but I still have four slides to go through, sorry. So uh, give me a, five minutes to, to carry on. So oh, we, have to, we want to just uh, the structure that we just described minimally to get to, to the structure that we want. And it will work. Um, you will carry on having objects that are triples. And so two, two sets and one relation, but the relation now is going to be an n-valued relation. Um, you're going to have the same sorts of morphisms that we had before, uh, a little f and a capital F, and they will still satisfy the same adjunction uh, condition, which is this R of u f y is less than equal in M to S of f u y. Um, I didn't even try to tell you the hard part, I mean, because the hard part is to actually then use some of Yetter's, uh, David Yetter's ideas uh, to, um, to get a common ad that starts from this non-commutative case and does the commutativity first and then does the, um, then does the multipl duplication and erasing thing to get back to logic as we know it. So, you know, you have to put together a collection of monads to get to where um, things are. Uh, and yes, we got to the conclusion. So what, what have we done? Um, I kind of introduced you to the lambic calculus, but only as a relative of linear logic. Um, I introduced you to dialectical categories and there's much more to say. And I try to use the trick of talking to you about the simplest one to try to show you how the, the calculations work on that. Um, I actually kind of meant to mostly describe the example that is the last slide that we're looking about, looking at. So the dial M sets, which is very much like the dial two uh, sets that we looked at, but now we have this M, um, we, we have a, an M where the multiplication is non-commutative. And I should have shown the modalities that make this whole thing work but I, I was not uh, courageous enough. And, I, and you might say, well, you know, Greg had asked me, well, you've been doing more work on that, what is new? And the new thing here is that um, when I first did this stuff, it was all about pure category theory without paying attention to the type theory. So I couldn't guarantee you then that, uh, that the type theory did what I expected to do, which is to keep the, the triangles going in parallel. Now we have implementations in Agda that show that the syntax works the way it's, it's expected to do. And, and we wanted to use some of this implementation results in Agda uh, for newer kinds of, of programming language phenomena. In particular, Harley and his PhD student, Chaying Chung, uh, are doing that. And they have been adding um, commutativity to the Lambic calculus in different ways for, for things like attack trees that I have no idea about. But you, know, they, you, you can always invite them to give a talk and, and, and talk about that. And there's lots of things that I didn't do. So in particular, I did not do any comparison with the pre-groups. I still wanted to do it. but haven't been able to. And you might want to ask, why don't I use any of this stuff um, on my language work? Because in another one of the supergroup things, I actually talked about my language work. And, and there I use a system that's very different from the language, from the Lambic calculus. Uh, and there, the answer is that I think um, Lambic, like me, is much more of a category theorist. He, his linguistic work did not pay enough attention to coverage and, uh, and ease and easy of easiness of implementation, stuff like that. So, you know, he, he, um, we can do this stuff if, if we want to, but I don't think it's the, um, the way I would do it, and it's not the way I'm doing it uh, at the moment. So thank you very much.